abortion introduction. <laughs> my name is Joseph Scrimshaw, and this is my show, The Comedy of Doom. I, in the next hour, I'm going to foolishly attempt to do a comedy bit about every major geek topic. Star Wars, Star Trek, furries, video games, furries, Doctor Who, furries, zombies, Furry. zombie furries. You can imagine. I considered starting with uh, Star Wars, but I was afraid if I started talking about Star Wars, I would not stop for the entire hour. So instead, I'd like to start by introducing you to my favorite television show. And I would like to introduce it to you as it was introduced to me. Imagine one day your older brother comes home and he tells you that this guy at school told him that there's this cool British science fiction show that comes on every Friday and Saturday night on the Sesame Street channel. <laughs> you had no idea that the Sesame Street channel broadcast after 10 a.m. But you decide to stay up late and you tune in. And I mean you literally physically tune in. Like you had to use your hand to turn a dial and adjust an antenna like you were a steampunk or something. <laughs> so you watch and the credits come on and, and this camera is flying down this dark, slightly bent tunnel. And this is eerily similar to a film you just saw in health class. <laughs> a pro with a camera flying through a urethra. <laughs> and you hear the music, and it's somehow creepy and cheesy and cool all at the same time, like if Al Yankovic wrote the music for your funeral. <laughs> then these monsters come on the scene, uh, and they're armed with guns and plungers and bumps that look like the robot equivalent of an STD outbreak. <laughs> And they fight with a charming man with a giant nose. And you wonder, what the hell is this? So you watch again on Saturday night, and you see an entirely different charming man with another giant nose. You're not used to seeing men with giant noses play heroes. These men would only be allowed on American television if they're playing serial killers or defense lawyers. <laughs> You want to know what the hell this is, so you go to look it up on Wikipedia. <laughs> but Wikipedia doesn't exist yet. <laughs> so you just ask your brother to ask that guy he knows at school. Which, when you think about it, isn't that different than looking it up on Wikipedia. <laughs> rolls around and you get the download. The show is called Doctor Who. The plunger monsters are called Daleks and the charming men with the giant noses are all called the Doctor. Because unlike a boring American hero, he doesn't die. He regenerates and they just get another actor. Usually a younger one. Soon the Doctor will be an infant. <laughs> And you love this show. You are amazed by it. He flies around in this blue box and travels through space and time. You don't know why he flies around in a blue box except for someone in 1963 thought that was a good idea and they have never changed it because damn it, they like it that way. <laughs> and so do you. Your life is now changed. Every kid you know likes superheroes and Star Wars, but this, this is a low-budget British science fiction show with women whose breasts are often fully covered. <laughs> Sometimes the show is blatantly educational. And it features a hero who actively tries to prevent cool military guys from blowing shit up. You will not be playing Doctor Who on the playground. As a more pessimistic Obi-Wan Kenobi might have said to Luke Skywalker, you have taken your first step into a much smaller world. And I took that step. I leapt off the cliff like a lemmy with mild astigmatism. <laughs> I went to my friends at school and I said, you, you have to try this show. So they watched it over the weekend and they came back and this is an actual quote. They said to me, 
that show is so stupid. If you keep watching it, it will probably give you AIDS. <laughs> school. Didn't have a very good sex ed program. The kids there were really cool and I was always kind of a weird artsy kid but they always liked and or tolerated me. But at the end of the year my family decided to move to a nicer neighborhood in a nicer school and against my will I was forced to regenerate. <laughs> At this new school, I was treated as a full-on geeky loser. Every day there was a reading period, and all the other guys would bring copies of Sports Illustrated, and they would just stare at the pictures and maybe sound out the captions now and again. I brought novelizations of obscure Doctor Who episodes, and I carefully wrapped them in a plastic comic book bag so the cover art wouldn't get dinged up at all. Now the bullies at this school, they were so sensitive to anyone being different at all, they were already pissed off at me because I could spell PBS. <laughs> but a British science fiction book in a comic book bag, that was like an assault on middle America. I just, just stood up on the chair and screamed that football sucks and their mothers all want to have sex with illegal immigrants. But despite my abnormal instinct of self-preservation, I continued in my love of Doctor Who when Halloween rolled around, I decided to dress up as the doctor's arch enemy, the master. A brooding, evil mastermind who wore all black, dark robes and black gloves. The best I could do for Halloween was some faded high water jeans, a black t shirt with a little alligator on the breast pocket, and one sparkly white Michael Jackson glove. <laughs> I spend the day repeating the master's catchphrase, which is, I am the master, and you will obey me. In retrospect, telling prepubescent girls to obey me was maybe a little creepy, but what are you gonna do? My conflict with these bullies culminated on a field trip. We went to the Minnesota State Capitol, and we were standing on the steps, waiting to get in, and one of the bullies decided to entertain himself with the stupidest of all bullying techniques, the tapping game. He would tap me on the shoulder, I would turn around, he would look the other way, and repeat. It was as if he were preparing himself for the monotonous factory job he no doubt holds today. <laughs> A little unfair, he's probably been laid off by now. <laughs> he was busy tapping away. Tap. All year long, I had resisted getting into a physical fight. Tap. I wanted to be a pacifist like the doctor. Tap. The doctor tried to talk out his issues first. Tap. I had tried to talk it out, and it didn't work. Tap. I admired the doctor for his kindness and his empathy. Tap. But I also admired his willingness to fight. Tap. The only thing bigger than the doctor's nose was his brass fucking Time Lord balls. I whirled around and I aimed for the bully's nose, but I got him in the forehead, but I got him pretty good. And then he hit me in the gut, and then the teachers pulled us apart, and I remember desperately flailing my legs trying to kick him in the nuts. <laughs> But we were pulled apart, and my mission had been accomplished. Now he continued to mock me, but he also always did it from very, very far away. <laughs> and sometimes, if I turned around quickly enough, he would flinch. <laughs> Thank you. I had triumphed exactly the way the doctor usually does with just enough justifiable violence to hang on to his pacifist prey. <laughs> Next year, I moved to yet another school, and I regenerated back into myself, an artsy kid who is just kind of weird. And for better or worse, uh, Doctor Who has helped make me the man-child that I am today. <laughs> that show taught me to value creativity, intelligence, odd fashion choices, <laughs> an absolute pig-headed, defiant individuality. Over the years, I've internalized my own little obscure Doctor Who novelization and lovingly wrapped it in a plastic comic book bag. And if there were an inscription on the inside cover, it would read, My name is Joseph Scrimshaw. I am my master. 
and I will obey me. Thank you. That's Doctor Who. So I feel safe to go on to Star Wars. Now, I take it that most people here are pretty familiar with the plot of Episode 4, A New Hope. And uh, how many of you spend a little bit too much time on Twitter? <laughs> Me too. So uh, I thought what I would do is try to retell the narrative of episode four with the Twitter feeds of the main characters. Enjoy. Tweet from Luke Skywalker. Just looked at twin sons and daydreamed about having an epic destiny. Eyes hurt. Need to stop looking directly into twin sons. LOL. Tweet from Princess Leia to Obi-Wan Kenobi. I need your help blowing up the Death Star. Tweet from Princess Leia to Obi-Wan Kenobi. Shit, that was supposed to be a direct message. <laughs> Shit. Tweet from Darth Vader. About to retrieve stolen Death Star plans and get my evil on. Sent from my Verizon chest unit. <laughs> Tweet from R2-D2. Pooty twoot? <laughs> Tweet from manager of General Goods Store in Toshi Station. Luke, your power converters are in. Are you going to pick them up? Tweet from C-3PO. I am C-3PO. This is my first tweet. Oh my, I'm not sure I get how this works. Ha ha, I understand there is a limit on the number of char- <laughs> Tweet from old Ben Kenobi to Luke Skywalker. I think I just called you. I didn't mean to. I had my phone in my robes and I accidentally force-dialed you. <laughs> Luke Skywalker to old Ben Kenobi, LOL. Wait, what is the force? <laughs> Reply from old Ben Kenobi to Luke Skywalker. It's a, mystic, a mystical energy field that binds and penetrates everybody. <laughs> that didn't come out right. Come to my hut. <laughs> Tweet from the Imperial Stormtroopers. Tatooine peeps, we're looking for these droids. They're kind of like Laurel and Hardy, but gay. Please retweet. Tweet from Han Solo. Han Solo just checked into the cantina on Foursquare. Tweet from Chewbacca. Ruar! Smiley face. Tweet from Luke Skywalker. Just found out my dad was murdered, got his lightsaber thingy, then found my aunt and uncle's burned corpses. FML. <laughs> Tweet from Han Solo. I just shot Greedo. He didn't even have a chance to get off his shot. <laughs> if anyone tells you he shot first, they're cock-sucking liars. <laughs> Tweet from Obi-Wan Kenobi. Just felt a great disturbance in the Twitter sphere, as if a million people tooted out in pain and suddenly had their accounts deactivated. <laughs> Tweet from Darth Vader. Felt awesome to blow up Alderaan. A little bummed about being so mean to Princess Leia, she looks and acts just like my dead wife. <laughs> soon because it happened a long time ago. Second tweet from Darth Vader. And she's about the right age to be my daughter. Maybe I should look into that. <laughs> Screw it. I'm gonna go choke some fools with my mind. Sent from my Verizon meditation chamber. Tweet from Han Solo. Alderaan is not here. Google Maps can suck my Corellian ass. <laughs> Tweet from manager of General Goods Store in Toshi Station. Seriously, Luke, your power converters are in. Are you going to pick them up? Reply from Luke Skywalker. Can't. Busy. Being sucked into giant armadillo space station. Tweet from Luke Skywalker. 
Sorry, meant armored space station. <laughs> Stupid autocorrect. Tweet from Han Solo. Hey, at Emperor underscore Palpatine, I'm in your space station shooting your dudes. <laughs> Tweet from Darth Vader, about to fight Obi-Wan. Last time we were spinning through the air and shit, now we look like 80-year-olds doing a polka with glow sticks. Sad. Tweet from Luke Skywalker, just watched Obi-Wan die. Second father figure killed in the last six hours. Getting pity hugs from Princess Leia. You take what you can get. Tweet from General Dodonna of the Rebel Alliance. Time it took the Empire to design and build the Death Star. Nineteen years. Time it took the Rebel Alliance to find Fatal Flaw. Two minutes. <laughs> Hashtag fail. Tweet <laughs> from Luke Skywalker. Flying around trying to blow up a space station before it kills everyone. Friends dying all around me. Probably shouldn't be tweeting right now. <laughs> Direct message from Obi-Wan Kenobi to Luke Skywalker's mind. Use the Force. Tweet from Luke Skywalker. Freaking out! Hashtag cryptic tweet. I hear the sound of younger women laughing at that. And it makes all too much sense. Tweet from Darth Vader. Flying in my spaceship, shooting down all these X-Wings. Could have stayed at home and choked the pilots with my mind. WTF. <laughs> Sent from my Verizon Twin Ion Engine Advanced X-1 Prototype Starship. <laughs> Tweet from Luke Skywalker. Proton torpedoes in the exhaust port shaft with the force for the win! <laughs> Tweet from Princess Leia. About to give the guys medals for blowing up the Death Star. Not giving one to Chewbacca. Kind of feel like a bitch about that. <laughs> oh well. Tweet from Chewbacca. Ruar! Sad face. <laughs> Tweet from Luke Skywalker. Lost two father figures. Killed millions of Imperials on the Death Star. Met some new friends. Used the Force. Pretty epic day for a farm boy. <laughs> Tweet from manager of General Goods Store in Tashi Station. Luke, we sold your power converters to someone else. Thanks for being a really shitty customer, Skywalker. And that's Star Wars! Star Trek, and for my bit about Star Trek, I really wanted to get to the essence of what this show is about, so I, I thought about Gene Roddenberry's quote of what this show is supposed to be, which is, a wagon train to the stars. So that got me thinking, you know, there should really be, like, an Oregon Trail version of Star Trek. So I wrote that, uh, and I'm actually going to play the game with someone, so if you'd like to volunteer to play Star Trek Oregon Trail on stage right now, please raise your hand. <laughs> the stranger in the plaid shirt. <laughs> on the stage. Feel free to just speak direct in the the microphone. Okay. Okay. Good. You're not, you're not gonna freeze up or anything. What? Okay. Good. We're good. Okay. Okay, so you can choose to play. Star Trek Oregon Trail is one of the three following characters. Okay. A Starfleet captain. I choose Wesley. <laughs> He's my favorite. I know that a lot of people make fun of him now in 1989, but I also know that sometime in the future he will have inspired a number of people to become doctors, engineers, and scientists. So he's clearly the best character in the history of Star Trek, past, present, and future. Ironically, so I think that's a, I think it's a great choice. We'll go with Wesley. Do, do you have a name that you'd like to give Wesley? You know, on Oregon Trail, you could type in a different name. Do you want like a funny middle name for Wesley Crusher? Uh. uh 
awesome. <laughs> All right. You've actually been promoted to captain in my game. It's so a fucking time! <laughs> So, Captain Wesley Awesome Crusher. <laughs> Say that again. <laughs> Wesley Awesome Crusher. Oh, man. That's just how I imagined it. That's the way I used to say it to my screen when I was watching. I know. <laughs> to get your Federation starship, the USS Wagon, <laughs> to the planet Oregon, located in the remote Beaver Quadrant. <laughs> Alright, let's do this! <laughs> you can invest credits in food replicators, dilithium crystals, phasers, or illegal Romulan ale. Illegal Romulan ale. <laughs> All right. So that I can feel strange, but also good. <laughs> You're going to boldly go where Wesley didn't go on the show. Stupid standards and practices can suck it. <laughs> it is star date 42385.1. You have no food, you have no phasers, uh -oh. you have no dilithium crystals, okay. and lots of illegal Romulan ale. You are 500 light years from the beaver quadrant. Everyone in your party with a red shirt died while getting on board the ship. Every time. Every time. Do you want to keep flying or do you want to go on an away mission to hunt Tribble? Let's go on an away mission and hunt Tribble. Awesome. You successfully kill four Tribble. Commander Riker engages in a sexual relationship with the Tribble. <laughs> Commander Riker has contracted space herpes. Again. <laughs> Do you maroon Riker on the planet, or take him with you? Listen, there's only room for one beard on this one. <laughs> maroon him. He is maroon. You continue fine. You are now 300 light years from the Beaver Quadrant. Awesome. The ratings of Star Trek Oregon Trail have taken a little bit of a dip, so you have to run into the Borg. <laughs> It should be bad, but it's actually going to be pretty sexy. It's going to be pretty awesome. Okay. I've got the script written for it. <laughs> uh, so you can engage the Borg in a firefight right now, or you can pilot the USS Wagon around the sun to travel in time in an attempt to avoid the Borg, who will also travel in time, in which case you will just have to fight them anyway. <laughs> Let's go around the sun. <laughs> Great, and we're probably going to win a VFX Emmy for it. Because <laughs> Lord knows we never won Emmys for anything else. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I heard that that's what happened on Star Trek, because I wasn't on it. I no, just watched it no, a lot. Yeah, me too, yeah. Because it's great. Yeah. That, that, I, I think that you're, you're so getting into the character of Captain Wesley Awesome Crusher, who's drunk on Romulan ale. <laughs> he super is. I'm just picturing you. And he's headed straight to the Beaver Quadrant. <laughs> having ruined Riker and says, let's go around the sun. <laughs> That's what you do. <laughs> so, you go back in time and you fight the Borg. Now, you're going to be very familiar with what happens next. You reverse the polarity of the tachyon field. Of course I do. And you emit a modulated techno bullshit pulse. <laughs> From the dish containing the fuck em a bob array. Right? Yeah, you know, yeah, like, no, of course, like you do, I'm following standard operating procedures. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. You don't need anybody's help. You need yeah, no, I got that. Fuck off, Data. Yeah. Go train your cat. And Jordy's probably putting his dick in a thing in the holodeck, so. Somebody's gotta take care of things. You defeat the Borg, but there are penalties. Um, like, Troy like, like, like Voyager exists now? Oh. We 
fucked up real bad. You did. You created Voyager and Enterprise. Oh, oh. God! And when you return back in time, you create the theme song to Enterprise. Oh, those people, they were innocent babies! Enterprise If only I had inverted and emit neutrino pulse through a subspace matrix past a warp beacon and put that into the heart of the anomaly, everything would have been different! <laughs> using that lithium crystals and the uh, isolated optical chips like they taught me at the academy. What I hear you saying is that you have actually entered the code of Star Trek Oregon Trail in like the Kobe... <laughs> now you have almost no supplies left. Oh. Uh, and if your trip lasts much longer, you will it's encounter... time for a clip show. <laughs> with Q, but yours is better. So you avoid a clip show and John Delancey. But you encounter a wormhole. Awesome! Does Captain Wesley Awesome Crusher go right straight up that wormhole? Screaming like Slim Pickens riding an atom bomb into the ground. Your hard Federation ship slips easily through the wormhole. What's Counselor Troy sensing right about now? The poor thing, all she can sense is Riker's space herpes from light years away. That makes sense. So you have now reached the Beaver Quadrant, home of the planet Oregon. <laughs> awesome. Would you uh, would you like to know your your final score? Yes. Unfortunately, it is zero points. Oh. This was a hollow deck thing. <laughs> Again? Again? But if you want to go in there and reprogram the Matrix, you can do that. So what you're saying is, I could go into the main power conduit through the Jeffries tube and rewrite the holodeck programming code to decouple the safety protocols so that when I actually maroon Riker, Riker's actually marooned on a planet and Enterprise still doesn't exist, but by the powers of flying through a warp wormhole and decompiling the entire holodeck source code program, I'm actually able to emit every pulse that needs to be emitted so that I can techno babble bullshit my way into number one top level ratings and somehow Nail Ashley Judd. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to say. This is the best game ever. Thank you for playing Star Trek Oregon Trail. I had fun while learning. a little piece about horror and I decided to put together a piece about my favorite horror author, H.P. Lovecraft. <laughs> so a lot of you are familiar with H.P. Lovecraft. For those of you who are not, H.P. Lovecraft was an effeminate, xenophobic Anglophile <laughs> who wrote disturbing stories about horrible monsters, dead gods, and the <laughs> ultimate futility of human existence. So what I did is I wanted to take some of those ideas and make them more kind of approachable to children. <laughs> so I wrote a kind of a Lovecraft for Kids story called The Thing That Should Not Be Under Your Bed. <laughs> and here's a little picture. <laughs> Page one of The Thing That Should Not Be Under Your Bed. Page one. There is a monster under your bed right now. It is going to kill you. And there is nothing you can do about it. Page two. It's a very strange looking monster. It has a big scaly head, a long slimy body covered in wings, tentacles, and thousands of beady little red eyes. The monster stands on two little heathen goat legs. And finally, the monster has a big, slobbering mouth. 
right where its vagina should be. <laughs> with teeth is called a vagina dentata. <laughs> I heard woo and ew. Fair enough. The term vagina dentata is something you will only learn if you go to college and get a useless liberal arts degree. And even if you do learn it, where are you going to use it? Job interviews, cocktail parties, casual conversations on the Lido deck? No, the only place to use a term like vagina dentata is in tasteless comedy shows. And it's usually too gross to get a laugh anyway. But you don't have to worry about that. You're not going to college because you are going to die. Tonight. Page three. Let's review some of the people in your neighborhood who can't help you. First, there's Mr. Policeman. If he doesn't immediately lose his mind just by looking at the monster, he might manage to fire off a couple of rounds from his tiny little gun. This is like casting a vote for a third party candidate. It is a nice gesture. It's not really going to do anyone any good. Then there's Mr. Priest. He's totally useless. Now, Mr. Librarian, he's your best chance. He has access to thousands and thousands of books filled with ideas and stories. Books are like chocolate you can eat with your mind. <laughs> Unfortunately, some books aren't very good for you. For example, there's a book called Ancient Sociocultural Iconography in Demonological Incantations for Dummies. Also known as the Necronomicon. For some reason, Mr. Librarian is willing to check that book out to any Yahoo with a library card and a photo ID. Which brings us back to your daddy. Page four. Your daddy is actually the reason the monster is under your bed in the first place. You see, your daddy is a cultist. Your daddy used to think that people who dress up in weird robes, perform ancient rituals, and worship dead gods were bad people. Then he realized that was a pretty accurate description of most religions. <laughs> so what the hell, he reasoned. And before he knew it, he was out in the woods, buck naked, chanting in the obscene tongues of long forgotten languages and sacrificing innocent little bunny rabbits, one after another. It was like Easter. <laughs> An endless bloody Easter of death. <laughs> Page five, the end. I know! It seems sudden, but really, what more is left to be said? There's a monster under your bed and it's going to kill you. We've known all the important information since page one, haven't we? And yet, you would like a moral to give a sense of conclusion to the story, wouldn't you? After all, that's why we tell stories, isn't it? We flail and grasp at all the events and ideas of our lives and try to uh, wrestle them down into something tidy and reasonable with a beginning, middle, and end. When in reality, we have no control over most parts of our lives. Certainly not the beginning, sometimes the end, but mostly we just get to fumble about with the middle. Fumble, 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 go the humans. And if, in our fumbling, we happen to discover that the narrative structure is an artificial creation, nothing more than a fancy paint job designed to cover up the poor workmanship in the universe's construction, so what? It's nice to share stories with friends. Stories that make us laugh and cry and think about different ways we might fumble around with the middle of our lives. Stories are fun. Unfortunately, yours is over. <laughs> because there exists in this world a thing that by all human standards of decency should not be. And it's under your bed right now. So to all you other children out there who get to go on living, good night, sleep tight, and don't let the vagina dentata bite. <laughs> Ready to move on to 
video games. How many of you guys have played Super Mario Brothers? I myself played the original 8-bit NES version many, many times. And when I say many times, I mean pretty much 1987 through like seconds before I stepped on this fucking boat. <laughs> For those of you who might not be as familiar, our main hero is an Italian plumber named Mario. He wears big red overalls, he's got a red cap, sports a big manly mustache, and he only expresses himself in brief, high-pitched Italian exclamations, such as, Let's go! And Mario also has a brother named Luigi. Luigi looks very much like Mario, except he has green overalls, he's been put on a medieval torture device to be stretched out, and then he's been repeatedly punched in the head. So he always looks just a little confused and drunk. You can find Mario and Luigi doing many things. Racing go-karts, playing golf, charting solar systems, prescribing medication. <laughs> The one thing you will never find them doing is any fucking plumbing. <laughs> Mario also has a girlfriend. She's a perky, high-maintenance southern belle named Princess Peach Toadstool. And here's the thing about Princess Peach. She is always presented as being perfectly competent to kick anyone's ass. And yet she always makes Mario come and rescue her. This is the video game equivalent of calling up your spouse at work and saying, I have a little itch on my nose, can you come here and scratch it? And when you ask, why? It's your nose! The only response you will get is, can you also bring your weird-ass brother? <laughs> But I digress. I'd like to return to the summer of 1987, when Super Mario Bros. secretly instilled in me everything I would ever need to know about having a healthy, romantic relationship. <laughs> Mario and Peach have a very dysfunctional relationship. Mario insists on being very manly to attempt to impress her. He is constantly jumping on things. He hits everything he can find with his head. Bricks, pipes, clouds, it doesn't matter. And Princess Peach, uh, I hate to be this blunt, Princess Peach is a cock tease. <laughs> You go through all of this work to rescue her. You do these weird things. You have your Mario take a mushroom. And when you take the, Mario, the mushroom, it makes your small Mario large. And then your large Mario takes a flower, and it makes your large Mario burn. <laughs> repeatedly. You swear so loud, a neighbor knocks on your door and asks if anyone is dying. That's, a, that's actually a true story. <laughs> and then you get towards the end of the game and you start to wonder if there's any possibility that there might be some bonus scene where you and the grateful princess consummate your quest and you feel really dirty and guilty and think that you must be the only person in the world that deviant and twisted to think that and then you grow up and look on the internet <laughs> you realize that's fucking mild so you start imagining what this bonus scene might actually look like Perhaps Mario would come over to Princess Peach's place and make some nice ravioli, maybe open a bottle of Pinot Noir, maybe fix her toilet, because he has a fucking plumber. <laughs> she would dim the lights, and Mario would put on some romantic music. Pierre, if you will. <laughs> Pierre? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. How can they resist their carnal desires with this erotic music playing? And so, the princess and the plumber would begin to copulate. And we know exactly what this would look and sound like, because we have been watching Mario bang things for the entire game. <laughs> disturbing cartoon boing sound. Doink, 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 doink. 
it would get faster and faster. And as always happens when Mario hits things, coins would be flying everywhere. Coins coming from God knows where. Coin, coin, coin. Oh, a mushroom. Coin, coin, coin. One up. Coin, coin, coin. And all the while, your creepy brother Luigi <laughs> is standing in the corner waiting to see if you die so he can press the B button and get his chance to play. <laughs> now, all of this horror slowly taught me some life lessons that took me a long time to decode. And the first lesson is that you should not date people like Princess Peach. There's a word for people like Princess Peach. Crazy. Don't date crazy people. Mario is a peach enabler. Don't be a peach enabler. Number two, if you do a bunch of weird, abusive things to try to impress someone, you're not a hero, you're a masochist. And rule number three, and this is the one that, that took me shamefully the most time to figure out, if you really want to have a healthy, romantic relationship, what sometimes works is to put down the video game controller. <laughs> And engage in the real world. Just open the door, take a deep, refreshing breath, and say to yourself, Let's go! Thank you. So, so we're running short on time, so I have to do a little bit of a mashup here. Uh, so what I've done is I, I've combined two great fantasy stories of Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings. <laughs> So what I've imagined is, what if Dumbledore was in charge of telling Frodo what he had to do with the one ring? <laughs> and to help me with this, uh, please, may I have Mr. Paul Saborin join me? <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. This microphone has wheat and all over it. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> Is you, do, you, do you feel prepared? Is there anything else you need to wipe or touch? <laughs> okay, I'm good. I requested no Irish jigs. <laughs> A little OCD happened in there. We got it. So you, you'll be playing uh, Dumbledore, and you've, you've chosen an actor to emulate, correct? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy Frodo Baggins in the indirect advice of utter uselessness. Uh, Dumbledore, what, what have you come to the Shire to warn me about? You are in grave danger. <laughs> so let's make a sandwich. I, I thought you said this was about my ring. You do know how to make a sandwich, don't you? Go into the kitchen, get a knife, Follow your heart and try not to die. <laughs> but, but what about the ring? It's very dangerous. Yes, you said that. Incredibly dangerous. <laughs> yes, I understand that part. Like if the two most dangerous things you can think of had a baby, and then trained the baby to be extra dangerous, the ring would be even more dangerous than that. <laughs> But what should I, like, do about it? You should be very, very frightened. <laughs> yes, but what productive course of action should I take? Frodo, this is very important, so I want you to listen very carefully. Here is what you shouldn't do. Oh, for fuck! <laughs> What, what shouldn't I do? Do not put the ring on. Okay, I wasn't gonna. This is no time for frivolity, Frodo Baggins. <laughs> you must not pick up the ring and slip it on your finger with the ease of a hot knife cutting through the butter for the sandwich you still haven't made for me. <laughs> do you understand, Frodo? 
you want me to save the world by making you a sandwich while not wearing a ring and being terrified about it? I'm not getting through to you. Perhaps you need to hear it in the form of a song. Oh, Mr. Bombadil! Hey, diddly ho, ring a ding ding the ho. Ancient and wise and sings little songs he makes up on the spot. Oh, oh, listen to this one about your destiny. When you're confused and you don't know what to do, sing the song and think through the clue, dip the clues. Take the thing to the place where the evil looms. Whip it out and throw it down in the crack of doom. Doom, doom, diddly diddle do doo. <laughs> was pretty clear. No! No, it wasn't! Start from the beginning and explain very slowly like you're talking to a child or an idiot. Explain exactly what I'm supposed to do. Why the hell can't you ever do this? Are you sure you're even talking to the right person? Of course, you unlikely heroes are all the same. You're brave but whiny. You resist help from friends. Evil lords can see through your eyes. You have scars that burn. I have a scar that burns? No, but you will. <laughs> what does that mean? Don't worry. You will survive. You have a secret power your enemy doesn't. What? Uh, I don't want to spoil the surprise. What? What is it? I can't tell you. What? It's love. Oh, love, do the 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 that romance developed. <laughs> so I have just a few minutes left, but I still have ten topics that I want to cover, so, so brace yourself. I'm just going to try to rush through this as quickly as possible. Uh, topic number one is Dungeons and Dragons. Parents, don't worry. Satan no longer speaks to your children through Dungeons and Dragons, but only because he thinks fourth edition sucks ass. <laughs> topic number two, uh, the, the works of Joss Whedon. My favorite thing about... I'm sorry, this joke has been cancelled. <laughs> Don't worry! The joke is going to come back in comic book form! <laughs> uh, topic number three is, is, is James Bond. Now, I know a lot of people don't think that James Bond fits in the sci-fi fantasy category, but if you don't think that James Bond fits into fantasy, then you have not spent enough time thinking about Daniel Craig's abs. <laughs> uh, topic number four, My Little Pony. <laughs> topic number five. Number five is Batman. I had a disturbing epiphany about Batman. Batman dresses up as a bat to strike terror into the hearts of criminals, right? But Batman is a ninja who can pop out of anywhere and kick almost anyone's ass. So he doesn't really need to dress up as a bat to scare people. So when Bruce Wayne puts on a Batman costume, he's basically just LARPing. <laughs> Topic number 
six is internet memes. Now, I'm, I'm a complete idiot when it comes to internet memes. It takes me forever to catch on to them. For months, I was confused and I thought, Pedo Bear was actually a new show that was being developed by Sid and Marty Croft. <laughs> Thank you, old people. <laughs> Uh, topic number uh, seven, seven, uh, a, a Game of Thrones. Now, the HBO adaptation is so successful, I believe that George R. R. Martin is actually going to change the title of the final book in the series, and the new title is going to be A Dinklage of Peters. <laughs> topic number eight is uh, Bacon and Ukuleles. <laughs> I have no joke, I just felt they needed a shout out. <laughs> Topic number nine is vampires. My favorite vampire is the Count from Sesame Street. <laughs> he is my favorite for four reasons. One, he has OCD. <laughs> Two, he has OCD. <laughs> Three, he has OCD. And four, felt don't sparkle, bitches. <laughs> Quantum mechanics. In theory, I both do and do not have a joke about quantum mechanics existing in my head right now. Thank you very, very much.